And uh, I want to thank the board for holding this meeting and for all that NID does. Um, I'm not here to wave around statistics and numbers. Uh, my name is Michael DiMartino. I'm a concerned member of our community. Uh, for the last three years, I've done a regional-based television and radio show called The Golden Road, where I broadcast now in seven counties, all the way from Siskiyou County in Mount Shasta to Sacramento and Davis to Truckee, including Nevada County, Butte County, uh, Shasta County, Sacramento County, Placer, and uh, Calaveras County. So the reason I'm here is because the issue of using Roundup and heavy metals in um, the irrigation ditches is absolutely unacceptable. So even though I'm just standing here as a person and I don't have pages and pages of research, I have over 200 hours of interviews and broadcast media that I brought in some of the top people in the country regarding glyphosate. Uh, I brought in water hydrologists and scientists. Um, I'm greatly involved in a water testing project right now. And there's a lot of science and concern in our community about this issue. So I'm here just to simply appeal to the humanity of that this is, uh, these are toxins that is affecting the health of our children and the health of our community. And if anybody wants to go to Golden Road TV on YouTube and watch some of the uh, testimonies and the science and the research of the people that I brought in and funded out of my own pocket to bring this um, up to the community's awareness, uh, you are happily can, can do that. But most importantly, that this is a real flashpoint. You know, whether it's NID using Roundup or heavy metals in the water or it's crystal geyser tapping the headwaters, uh, of Mount Shasta, where the, the city of Wheat has actually lost their water rights. Um, these, are, these are serious issues. This is about the vitality and health of our community for decades and generations to come. And currently, I'm organizing a water protectors rally at the state capitol in September, where all of these issues are going to come to light, because uh, I'm just one person, but I represent the voice of thousands of people that I've met face to face and parents whose kids suffer with some of these illnesses and it's completely, it's just not acceptable. So I know it's a hard job to sit there and make decisions. I know all of you probably have families and you want to do the right thing and there's a lot of pressure. But I'm appealing to you as just a human being right now, not an inv investigative journalist, not a researcher, but someone who is really um, horrified on the impact of these things in our environment and to our community. And I hope that within your hearts you can all find um, the opportunity and the technology and the funding to do the right thing. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us here today. I'm Mike Pasner. This is my daughter, Yara Pasner. Uh, we are Indian Springs Organic Farm. We've been farming here in Penn Valley organically for 32 years. We will be co-presenting this afternoon. I'll start with some history of our uh, some history of the use of Nevada Irrigation's district water on our farm. Yara will give an overview of NID's origins and evolution of current practices. And we'll finish with potential threats and how you can help bring about positive change for health and safety. Once the farm closed escrow in 1986, I went into NID's main office here in Grass Valley to pay my NID bill. They presented me with a calendar of the days they would be shutting my water off during the irrigation season. The reason for the shutoff was a drip application of aquatic herbicides directly into the irrigation water. This seemed like the most nonsensical thing to do, putting poison directly into water. Don't the animals drink it? Doesn't it end up in the well water and the natural water system? Over the last 32 years, I've been filing public records requests, attending public meetings, corresponding with NID staff and board members, and making noise. This is not right. Today we're here to convince NID to lead our state and nation in reducing our dependency on aquatic and terrestrial herbicides.
NID's water conveyance system was originally developed for miners, resulting in a complicated net of canals and reservoirs that were dug for the temporary purpose of conveying water to and from mines. Over, the last, over 100 years ago, these ditches were adapted to support the new thriving economy growing in our district, agriculture. Today, there are about 475 miles of irrigation ditches in NID, and for the last 40 years, 350 miles of these canals have been treated with herbicides. Roundup is applied to the irrigation ditches throughout the year with no notice beforehand. Roundup contains glyphosate, which, as we've discussed, has been found to be carcinogenic in court for causing Dwayne Johnson's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment has since placed glyphosate on California's Proposition 65 list of chemicals known to cause cancer. NID has responded by forming the Integrated Vegetation Management Working Group with the mission of field testing alternatives to glyphosate-based Roundup. Although the effort is headed in the right direction, this working group is seriously flawed. It is not open to the public, nor is it accepting recommendations from the public to guide their research, which hamstrings the, works, the working group's ability to operate with transparency and potentially to succeed at their mission. Rubber tracked excavators are already used once a year to clean the ditch system, and we propose this method would be suit a suitable alternative to Roundup and the use of elemental copper. The working group is not currently considering expanding on this simple solution. Additionally, the working group is aimed only at reducing glyphosate use. NID has not invested in a program to reduce their dependency on copper-based herbicides such as Nautique, Coutrine, and Keptan, which are dripped directly into the water monthly during the irrigation season, the six months between April 15th and October 15th. During aquatic herbicide, treatments, NID is permitted to legally apply copper-based herbicides directly into the water. NID has claimed the copper levels of up to 2,500 parts per million are safe for animals to drink. However, a 2008 California Environmental Protection Agency report specifies that consuming 250 parts per million of copper made pigs lose significant body weight and levels as low as 10 parts per million of copper in their diet made sheep ill. Recently, research from NID's California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab. UC Davis's. UC Davis's, yes, I miss that, I guess. UC Davis's Health Lab indicates that water guidelines for copper levels in livestock, drinking water should not be above 0.5 parts per million, which is 5,000 times less than NID's guidelines. 5,000 times less. A test from our irrigation water on poison day showed 1,100 parts per million of copper in the water. When I presented these numbers to NID, NID's Resource and Maintenance Committee, I earned a cease and desist letter from NID's legal counsel accusing me of stealing water and putting ourselves at risk. Really stealing water? At risk because of herbicide treatments they say are safe to swim in and for our animals to drink? We do, we do have the right to test our water on our own property. Moving forward, we are going to continue asking questions and engaging with NID to help make their public records more accessible. Our two latest public records requests are for exact levels of how copper that are, exact levels of copper that are found in irrigation water, natural streams, and above water treatment plants how much Roundup and also how much Roundup has been applied to the system during each of their roughly 400 terrestrial applications throughout 2018. We also have an interest in motivating NID to update their public information regarding when and where both copper-based aquatic herbicides and Roundup are being applied. So how can you help end this toxic treadmill? Call or write NID. Ask them to open the Integration Vegetation Management Working Group to the public, to us, and expand the group's mission to reducing their dependency on copper and glyphosate-based herbicides. Also, let your board representative know that you are concerned about their herbicide use and its effects on water, livestock, and people. We have developed a website that has this information that we presented here, maps, pictures, and more. 
Please visit with us after this presentation or online at safeditches.com to learn more. Today, NID's expansive irrigation system has provided irrigation water to farmers and ranchers for more than a century. And that service is integral to our community's rich agricultural history. NID has the potential to be an excellent steward of our community's resource, leading our state and nation away from chemical dependency. Help them realize this potential, get herbicides out of our water. Big thanks to Michael DiMartino for hosting this community resilience event. Thank you. So a little background, the district, uh, we are updating the raw water master plan through a community involvement process. This process aspires to reach and involve everyone within the community to help guide NID's water resource management efforts now and into the future. The process is intended to develop strategic options that reflect a balanced mix of community perspectives and values. On April 25, 2018, the board approved a public involvement process a public involvement based raw water master plan update process and staff began to develop the process and a project team. On September 6, 2018, the board adopted resolution 2018-20 to contract for facilitation and public outreach efforts to support the raw water master plan 2018 update. Lots of project team activities went into place during that period and on November 14th, 2018, uh, when it was brought to the board to vote on the community representatives group's um, guidelines and process, that vote was tabled by the board discussing, uh, was voted to table um, the CRG guidelines process until the new board is seated in 2019. So here we are. Mm -hmm. On December 1st um, and 10th, NID uh, continued two previously uh, scheduled public outreach workshops to provide the community an opportunity to discuss the issues and concerns that they felt for long-term water resources planning. The results of those two meetings will be discussed at this presentation and are within the packet that you have in your board packet. Um, and it's really for informational purposes only. Of course, you can ask questions about it. Um, the board today will also be given an overview presentation of the two different options. Um, and process approaches for integrated resource water planning. Number one, the community representatives group uh, process, and two, the alternative AWWA M50 process. Both processes um, are based on the same guidelines and contents. The AWWA 50 process is a tested method for water resources planning for many agencies throughout the state. The M50 process manual is currently in its third edition and it was developed through collaboration with over 40 professionals in the water agency, academic, non-government, and consultant professions. The M50 process incorporates traditional methods of developing analyses and presenting those findings to the community, similar to a CEQA-based document. The CRG, Community Representatives Group, on the other hand, is unique. It's different. It's somewhat experimental. NID has never done anything like this before. The CRG process still follows M50 guidelines, but the difference is the community involvement aspect is amplified. Through the CRG process, the community is highly engaged and will take an active role in the development of integrated water resource planning alternatives. The CRG process has community engagement and participation as a leading principle while seeking commitment on common understanding of water needs and the community trust. From the beginning, the CRG process seeks to offer ways for multiple community identities a chance to participate in a balanced way and contribute directly to the process. NID is currently engaged 
in the CRG process. Those were the first couple meetings that we had in December. And now staff seeks direction from the board on which approach, approach to take moving forward, the AWWA M50 or the CRG process approach. I'm going to introduce Mr. Jim Crowley, who's the program manager, manager for the raw water master planning process to go through the presentation with you. And I would ask that we hold all of our comments and questions to the end of the presentation. It's roughly 15 or 16 slides, and then we can follow up with comments after that. How's that? Greg, is yes, it sir. fair to say there seems to be an element of uh, getting off to a bad start and we're taking a step back to come at it again with this? I think it's fair to say that the first two meetings were uh, were well, but you're going back for it. You're, you're saying sorry. this M50 50. versus the C, the community base. Yeah. So we just want to make sure that's what we are going to do kind of thing. So kind of stuck back and coming at it again a little bit. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, the, the pr this because is because we had, had a couple meetings, so I'm just curious. Sure. So here we are. It really is the community engagement process that we're looking to go forward with. Which oh, oh, so it did sound a little biased in your presentation there. Okay. Sure. So because that's what we've started that's what you'd like or all right I, I, yeah I, it, it is what we will what what you will decide on today but this right? other, this other is an alternative this other is a stated alternative that the state and many agencies throughout the state have been using for quite some time the AWA day and okay. 50 process so this is just two different two different ways of engaging in the m50 process what so you the don't CR like me saying backing up. Uh, we're pausing we're to pausing. take an opportunity to make sure that this we're is what we're We're taking a reflective do. light on what we have done and where we are now. The reflection does look back. So that, yeah. <laughs> but we okay, are looking right forward. Thank you. You said to hold. Thank you. We'll, okay. we'll hear the presentation. All right. I'm just trying to reference it. Somehow. Set up the presentation. Good morning, board and public. And public. My name is Jim Crowley. I'm the Good morning, board and public. My name is Jim Crowley. I'm the Raw Water Master Plan Update Program Manager for NID. Uh, just to answer your question, Mr. President, um, the previous uh, process was started, developed, and directed by the previous board. This is an opportunity for the new board to see what was developed and determine if there is an alternative okay. direction. Fair, fair. So okay, good. That's where we are on that. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, Greg stole a, a lot of my thunder. Um, <laughs> but to, today, we're going to go over the program uh, history and timeline, uh, talk about the status to date the w and the workshop re results, uh, talk about the alternative approach and then have the board discuss it and uh, hopefully provide us direction on which way to go. Uh, the program timeline Greg went over started back in April uh, and then brought, brought us all the way through the workshops in December. <laughs> I, I know. Ah. Okay, so um, what has been developed to date? This is the the process that has been developed to date. It's basically a six-step a six process. Uh, process one is recruit and, and launch the community team. Uh, process two is understand our, our water needs. That's going over the projected demands, projected supplies, and seeing where the shortfalls are. Uh, process three is creating alternatives to meet those shortfalls. Uh, process four is presenting those alternatives and the benefits and impacts to the community to the board to discuss and select a alternative or group of alternatives um, that becomes the guiding purpose for the raw water master plan update. So then the raw water master plan update becomes a repository of all the technical work that was done in the previous steps and then it also presents an implementation plan to implement the projects uh, that will come out of the, the board's vision for the future. Uh, and then the last step is implementing each of those projects. Those projects are standalone projects that go through this 
SQL or NEPA process, depending on what it is. So that, that those end up being uh, the standard project implementation process. So that's what's been designed to date. Uh, so we talked about the two workshops that we had in December. Uh, we had a uh, targeted outreach plan to advertise those. Um, more, uh, multimedia, um, very successful with over a, a million media impressions. Uh, we had almost 600 unique website vi visitors. Question here. Um, what, is, what is the what media impressions? Yeah. We only have less than 100,000 people in the whole yeah. county. How, <laughs> what is a, a million media <laughs> impressions? So a media impression is every time someone sees a message. Oh, it's just a view? So it's not per people, it's per view. How do you, how do you measure that? So um, <laughs> it's measured based on the um, each different type of media have their own metrics. For instance, if you have um, a newspaper ad or a website banner, those, provi those providers have uh, statistics on how many people click on those or click through, and those are the statistics that they give to the media buy buy buyers, which is us, to uh, show us how many clicks we got. So they've got tracking cookies. Co Tracking cookies, yeah, they're so they're classic. Classic. that's on the website. Uh, billboards Most have their own uh, uh, an analysis that they provide. So uh, just so I understand, so as an example, if you take out a, a, an ad in our local Grass Valley paper, they have a circulation of whatever it is, 35,000. Um, is there, I don't know, someone hears from the union, they could tell us, but so then is the assumption then that all, all subscribers see the ad and that's how it's counted? Or is there assumption that there's some percentage? So I'm not familiar with their uh, um I'm just using the numbers as an uh, example. Yeah. I, this is submitted to him. Yeah, this is what's provided oh. to us yeah, by the media companies. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. That's, He's reporting that's a thing, but that's yeah. what it is. It's, yeah. it's just internet. Okay. So specifically on the workshop, we talked about a multimedia program, print ads in the union, the journal and the messenger, online ads, uh, radio, radio spots. Um, we, the project team, actually reached out to o over 60 folks with uh, emails and calls to invite them to the workshop. Uh, and then we had social media um, uh, target, target targeted outreach as well. Uh, the earned media, that's media that we didn't pay for. So we, we got two articles in the journal, one in the union, and one radio interview. Uh, so the results of that is we got 110 people to uh, show up at the uh, workshops. Uh, over 200 thoughts and concerns from the, from the community. Um, and each of the individual workshop reports are in your board packet, uh, provide the details of all those inputs and ideas that the community provided. Uh, if you group them into main themes, um, the community told us that they want uh, to practice integrated water resources planning they want to protect and maintain their community traits. There's your sustainability uh, word. Uh, they want to increase role in community, uh, or an in, they want to increase role in decisions at NID. Uh, and they also need to understand NID's responsibilities, roles, and processes. Um, so the workshops. Uh, the successful uh, outcome of the workshops is the community was able to have discussions about all of their concerns outside of the board, the board room in an environment where all ideas were, val were valued and in included. Um, as Greg mentioned, you know, we had some issues. The, ve the venues 
will be not ideal for um, these workshops. Um, the content did not pro provide or answer everyone's questions. So we know we need to work on that. Um, so we have here a table of the uh, evaluation of the December 10th um, workshop. Uh, we had PP people score seven elements of the workshop. Five of them received a score of, of good or better. Uh, the two that did not receive good marks, what we talked about before, the meeting space uh, and the, the closing reflection. So we need to provide a um, uh, better context for the discussion. Uh, so, you know, we're just getting started in this process. What have we uh, learned so, uh, so far? Um, it's a new process for all. NID side, public side, um, it's not what we're all used to. So we all have to uh, spend a little bit higher level of time, openness, and patience letting the, um, letting the process to develop. Uh, what we've also learned is the alternatives that were identified by the, pub by the public in the workshops are mostly the same alternatives that have been considered or discussed by NID to some extent. I think what we just have to do is have that discussion with the public, with the pub, pub, public, in order to go over the the assumptions that have gone that that have gone in and the um, analysis and alternatives. Uh, and then the third thing we've learned is, you know, we're, we're just starting this process. St still, lots of angst around around it, but we feel the w workshops were a good. St a good, a good start to getting the community um, thoughts and concerns involved in the, pr the process. Okay, um, Greg talked a bit about this. The um, process to date is is funded on the uh, the public involvement uh, uh, ideals of updating the raw water master plan. So to date. Uh, the thoughts and strategies behind public involvement is provide ways for everyone within the community to participate and contribute, uh, provide everyone in the community uh, options or ways to um, actually develop alternatives as opposed to just one alternative but multiple alternatives and help guide NID's water resources man man management for the future. Um, key to this whole public involvement process is the community representatives group, this CRG, uh, initially in envisioned as approximately 30 member group uh, made up of different community identities. Um, so we're looking for uh, every as many as, as possible members of the community to provide their values and their reasons for being in the community. Make sh sh sure that that gets incorporated into the alternative uh, uh, analysis. Uh, starting the very at the beginning, looking at demand for CAS and supply for CAS and developing alternatives. Uh, it is a very intensive uh, process, no doubt about it. Um, so we had some concerns about the, the effort and the intensity of the process. Um, so as Greg may, may, may mentioned, we're um, going to, to talk about the AWWA M50 uh, Water Resources Planning Manual. Uh, developed by AWWA, which is the water industry's leading advocate. Um, the M50 guidelines have a lot of recommendations and elements and steps that they mention should be part of a water resources plan. Uh, they're kind of boiled down to three main are are areas. Pro program development is 
kind of designing the process and getting it started. Two technical analysis um, going through the demand uh, supply and alternatives. Uh, and then three is community involvement. Um, so we have a table here. This first table compares the recommended guidelines for program development and technical comparison between the M50 and the CRG approach. So uh, identifying the program scope, the planning team needs, water demand forecasting, supply forecasting, uh, alternatives analysis. You know, both, both approaches have um, those elements from the, from the uh, recommended guidelines. Um, community involvement comparison, kind of the third element of the, gui uh, uh, of the guidelines. Both approaches are based on the International Association of Public Participation Principles, uh, and both um, uh, develop and define the extent of public involvement based on the program need as approved by the Board of, uh, of Directors. So when you compare the two processes, both based on the same diet, 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 guidelines and principles, they both have technical analysis. Um, so the difference is in the community involvement process. The M50 is more of the traditional way that our industry uh, creates plans, technical analysis and alternative development, narrow it down, bring it out, pre uh, present it to the public. Um, CRG uh, brings the community in at the very beginning of the technical analysis um, and they stay with it throughout. Uh, the CRG uh, is a very time intensive process. It uh, requires a high, le high level of commitment um, from the agency and from the public that wants to be a part of this, this process. Uh, so that's uh, the main differences <coughs> between the CRG process and the M50. Um, as I started off with, the purpose of the presentation is to provide this current board the opportunity to, to um, give alternate direction on the process approach and the scope of community involvement. Uh, so at this time, if you have any, any questions, we'd like to take to those and um, eventually working towards direction from the board on a process to follow and type and extent of community involvement. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm the one that made the motion back to bring this back now. So, yeah, new directors, you, here we are. You, uh, uh, and of course, there's always Nick. No. <laughs> I, 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 you have the floor, sir. I, I cede the floor to you if you'd like to speak no, first. You're, you're there. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Um, so, I, I'm just trying to get my head around uh, how the M50 process differs from the CRG, or, or for, from, yeah, from the CRG. Uh, my guess is, or, you know, what I'm getting the impression is that there's not a lot of difference, that the CRG process could actually live within the M50 process. So the M50, I've read the M50 manual. The public process is not, not well defined. So the CRG process could actually work for the M50 process, and the technical aspects are rather similar. Uh, what am I missing? So I think it becomes an issue of how much and what type of community involvement. Your, your slides kept saying at the end of agency's discretion under the M50 and the CB, CRG seems to define it further. 
Well, you know, there is, there is, you know, this CRG, we've had time to develop that, you know, so we've, under the current or the past board direction to develop a community involved update process, we went, went into the details of that. M50 says you, uh, you should have a community process, it's important, but it doesn't say what you're supposed to do. It doesn't, it doesn't, may really, vary. It doesn't, it doesn't specify the architecture. No. Of the, okay, so uh, my, my impression is correct. It, the M50 process is not very specific as to the public participation component of the process. So you could have a CRG live within either process. Mm -hmm. um, I have, a, I have a question. Can you comment on the price difference between uh, the M50 versus the CRG? As uh, I know that we've signed contracts for 800000 plus for the CRG. How does the price for administering the M50 process compare? So the public involvement process is really comes down to level of effort. So it's going to cost the level of effort currently scoped is that cost. If the board selects to have a smaller level of effort, one would assume that that uh, cost would go down. But with respect to the technical analysis aspects uh -huh. of M50, uh, I don't see... It would be the same, yeah. roughly, right? Right. Correct. And one of the big differences I, I got from some of this is that the CRG, as it is designed, is 24 months. It's a very long process. It's an involved process. Right. And the M50 can be shorter. Is that correct? We can do, we could, could we do that? I see our general manager shaking. Yeah. We could do that <laughs> over a period of, say, 12 months. And by virtue of shortening the time, we could still have a robust community participation component to the M50. And by virtue of shortening it from 24 to 12 months, there could be some significant cost savings. Is that correct? I think that if you shorten the public involvement, it will have cost savings. Thank you. So my question uh, to the staff on the board is, um, what did we do, what did the NID do the last time we had a water rate, uh, not water rate, the no, water, water update? update. Uh, so the last time was process. based on an M50 model. In 50 months. Yes. So that went through the process. We've done, we had experience doing that already. Yes. Okay. And it primarily came out of engineering department. That's uh, correct. That is correct. And we did have stakeholders meetings on this. Um, we bifurcated. Let me explain, if you have a few seconds. Okay. Might as well discuss the sure. existing raw water master plan. And was that, was that, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Was no. That, no. <laughs> no. Sorry, no. no. I'm going to do a short version. Okay. 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 My question did, was that in-house or did we have a consultant do that? We had a consultant do the original one. Jim and Rem doesn't know because I was, that's, it, you've answered the question, Jerry. Okay. We did have public stakeholder meetings, and as we moved to the secret document, we had public meetings, too. Okay. Perfect. Right. How many have we done over the years? Here, yeah. Yeah. Three. Well, raw water master plan. I believe we had three during the development of the raw water master plan. Okay. Then when we did the CEQA document, we had one in Nevada County, one in Placer County for the notice of preparation. Then when we did the draft EIR, I had another meeting up here and down in Placer County for that. Draft uh, EIR of. Well, the draft. The that's why it has to be explained. Mm -hmm. The raw water master plan is, has eight chapters in it. At, at this current time, the board has approved the first seven chapters. Eight was financial. Eight okay. was financial projects. and it involved projects and it has to come under CEQA. Yeah. Okay. That CEQA document were to the draft EIR. Um, it has a $300 million price tag for that work. That's where the, the slowdown happened. For the CEQA? For no, for the, for the work, for the chapter eight. eight. The, oh, chapter eight. eight. <laughs> no, we already have paid for that. So in essence, we had multiple meetings on that issue. Currently, we're operating under chapter one through seven on a lot of issues with the district, sizing of pipelines and such as that. Thank you, Jerry. I have, my, my primary concern with the current process as it stands 
is that it appears that the strategic plan is embedded in this raw water master plan, when in fact I believe a strategic plan is a completely different, much higher level document. And in M50, this is the M50 manual, and in the M50 manual it says developing plans, that strategic plans are action-oriented for management level decision and setting direction. And so, if we, and so, and master plans are to support capital improvement programs. And so if we have, we have a strategic plan that's expired, it was from 2016 to 2018, and of course it's a, you know, it, it needs to be revisited. We need to decide what direction we're going, so we, if you don't know where you're going, any road's going to do, and we can waste a lot of money trying to figure out where we're going. And so I think we should change, I mean, I agree with everything you said, that CRG is embedded, in, and we as the district, we can define how much public involvement we want in the process. But without a, a strategic plan that's been well thought out, that had community involvement, that was discussed by the board, so we've been in business 100 years, now we're going into our second millennium. Talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> we're going into our second millennium. Almost. Almost. It's time to stop and reevaluate. Is what we were doing before, is it working? If it's working, let's keep doing it. If it's not working, maybe part of it's working, maybe part of it's not working. We need to step back and do a strategic plan to figure out where we're going and then launch the raw water master plan. I, I completely agree it needs to be done and perhaps the strategic planning process won't take near as long as the master planning process. But we could have some public meetings, we could get input on the strategic plan and keep them separate documents. Don't embed the strategic plan inside a master plan. And that's what I'm, my understanding of this particular plan for water embeds the strategic plan. Well, we won't have a strategic plan, all we'll have is a, I haven't seen any discussion on strategic plan separate from the raw water yeah. master plan. Yeah. So, may I? Yeah. Okay. So just so the board's aware, we're starting our strategic planning process. The APC is leading that charge. Each one of the committees will carry their section. So that's so that happens So I don't think we should start the raw water master plan until we've finished our strategic plan. I think no. that we need to know the direction we're going before we spend a lot of time on the master <laughs> plan. And also this plan for water and, and the, the, the public involvement process, I'm 100% for. But the, um, the terminology, pathways when you say when I hear a path and I'm an engineer so you know my lim my vocabulary is limited but I go <laughs> is that is that a strategy is it is it an action cool what is it and so it's not common language it's not and and this says use plain English call it what it is say it wait I want to speak clearly and plainly so any person can understand what it is we're doing so what would you like to suspend and do a strategic plan first? I that's would. what I'm hearing you that, say. That's my recommendation, is to suspend and do well, a strategic plan. I don't want to put more words in that. No, that is. That's what okay. I said. That's, that's what I said. Okay. You, you summarize. You, you heard it correctly. A lot of words. <laughs> yeah, I want to re review um, for a moment the way, the way things <coughs> happened. Um, we did a strategic plan in 2010. We did a raw water master plan uh, and adopted chapters one through seven in 2011. 2013. Or 2013? 2013. Okay, 2013. Five years. One of, one of the outstanding conclusions of that raw water master plan was that uh, in a multiple, multiple dry year scenario, we were flat out of water after three years uh, even while imposing stage five drought restrictions. So that's even, I don't know, what does that do to ag? That, is that 50% ag, 50% urban, or is it 100% ag, 50% urban in stage five? I, I forget. Uh, but it's a really severe level of uh, drought contingency planning, and we're flat out of water after three years. Okay. so. Um, you know, we, we kind of noodled that recommendation that was adopted by the board. It was not objected to by any member of the public. So that is the adopted plan and that's the data that is out there. And people can dispute that data after the fact, but that is the data that the public accepted at that time. In the raw water master plan. In the raw water master plan. Okay. so. Again, just tracing through the history of this, you know, uh, you know, we're we're in a situation of declining snowpack, uh, and 
perhaps challenged in terms of uh, storage capacity. So we looked at increasing district storage, and you can look at all kinds of other things. Um, meanwhile, um, there are some data uh, that were not really included in the 2013 raw water master plan. I think our understanding of the impacts of climate change have become much much clearer in the interim. And therefore, the other, the other, um, the other impact uh, that was not considered in the 2013 raw water master plan is the whole issue of in-stream flow. Um, so, you know, we, we were in the midst of the FERC process at that time. We did not know the outcome of the FERC process. We could not plan for future in-stream flow requirements. Those are clearer now. Now those can get cranked into the modeling along with climate change impacts. And so the data on which the 2013 raw water master plan was established is not current and it needs to be it needs to be updated. Absolutely. That's that's why we're in this process. This is really a continuation of the old process. We have been accused of let it, letting the cart get before the horse and so on. I would argue, and, and you have said that, uh, Director Peters, mm -hmm. I would argue that's actually not the case. We're simply updating uh, the old plan with current data. Right. So are you uh, advocating for continuing the raw water master plan process uh, in lieu of or before the strategic plan? I think we need to continue the raw water master planning process that we're currently in. We we need to uh, we need to you know roll into strategic planning, uh, but we need to update the existing plan. Yes, I agree, Director Wilcox. I think that the the difference is that like as you mentioned, there's a lot of technical work that has to be done that that we need to bring that we need to prepare, and we can be preparing that technical work. We can be working on incorporating looking at the models including the climate change and, and this we can do that technical work while we're doing the strategic plan and defining how we want public participation and, and, and setting it as part of this other process I mean we could do that which they can be done together it's not saying we have to linearly do them is my point. Uh, so I have no problem with rolling into another strategic planning process but I think we need to continue uh, on the track of updating the current raw water master plan with with data that we currently have. You know, the current raw water master plan is outdated. One of the things that has changed, and, and Ram can confirm this or not, is that, um, you know, we, we were looking at, at a three-year critically dry scenario uh, in the uh, current raw water master plan. The state is now requiring us to look at a five-year sequence. Is correct. that true? That is correct. Uh, Okay, so we need five, to five dry, dry years, five five um, or five critically dry yeah, years. Yeah, um, critically dry. You, you know, the, the the worst case scenario that we have experienced is the 76, 77 period, which is two critically dry years. The likelihood of a three year critically dry sequence occurring is is real. Uh, the likelihood that a five year critically dry sequence could occur is also real. Um, and I'm not sure how, how we get through the five-year sequence. I, I, um, I'm just not sure. I mean, we, have, we, have a seri we have serious issues confronting us. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll get off my soapbox. Well, let me weigh in. Oh, is that OK, Mr. President? Yes. OK, it's thank you. Open discussion. Thank you. Um, so, I think I agree with everybody. I agree we need our strategic plan. I agree we need to continue our raw water master plan. Absolutely, we do. I think what, what we're looking at here today is what is the mechanism to do that? Whether it is the 800 to a million dollar uh, cost of the CRG two year that or if it's something else that we can get done in a little shorter time with hopefully a lot less money. Um, and I think that we can, can um, 
include a little bit more robust community involvement because I believe we must have the community involvement. We must have our stakeholders at the table. We must have members. In fact, what I'd like to see and discuss with general manager yesterday is some kind of uh, like town hall type things where each one of us goes into our divisions and we bring in people from the from the varying divisions who all have different interests. You know, Director Peters has more ag folks and and you know you have a pretty mix of ag and you know and I have you know a different demographic and it would be nice to bring those people in rather than just say you know I think your thing said you sent out 60 emails to people who signed up I sort of feel like if we're more proactive we would maybe get more inclusion and you know I would the other thing is I don't think we have time to wait for two years to get this thing done honestly I don't think we need two years to do it. I think we can do it quickly, more efficiently, and cheaper if we do some other process. So there you go. And 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 I I would, you know, I would applaud a process that could be done quicker <coughs> and easier and cheaper. Well, the M50 um, one says it is. I don't uh, know. Well, the public, it, it might be done a little quicker. Uh, the, I'm not sure. I'm not sure in the end that you win if you try and do a quicker, easier, cheaper process. Because we're, we're criticized no matter what we do. And if we opt for a quicker, cheaper <laughs> process, we'll be criticized for that. We'll be criticized for a longer process because it takes more money. We'll be criticized for a shorter process because it's not long enough. Well, you know, I, I took the liberty of I mean, checking. You're damned if you do damned and you damned do, if you damned don't. Damned. No, I, well, except that. Now, I took the liberty um, of going to the county and finding out they had this CAG process, which was different. Um, they had 14 meetings facilitated by professionals. They had 25 members of the CAG, the community advisory group, and the county paid $138,000, and it was about an 18-month process. Um, I know we have someone here who, who was on that CAG process, and, and I think there might have been a couple of others. And I'm not saying it was perfect. I'm not saying everybody was happy. The truth is we're probably not going to make everybody happy no matter what we do. But given that we're talking about raising rates, given that there might be discussions about other ways in which we can spend the money, I think it's worth looking at some kind of combination that that you know, eight hundred thousand dollars is just a burn for me. I just have to say, it's just a burn. <laughs> On the subject of the eight hundred thousand dollars, I'm confused about where there would whether there would be additional costs or not in addition to that already. Okay, if we went to the two year process versus the one, if we do a one year process, do we do we get money back or? Well, so what's included uh, in the we re renegotiate the contract. We renegotiate. I think if, yeah. if the board selects the M50 process, so we will rejigger the we'll rejigger our plan for water, and so the savings would be in the contract scope of work modifications mm -hmm. to the consultant team, okay. right? So the M50 does a does a few things. It does have a public process. We would engage in that public process. It does define uh, it better defines our course, right? Mm -hmm. The CRG was completely experimental. We were trying something way outside the box. Bringing us back into the M50, we still have a public process, we still have those mechanisms, but we have more control, I guess is a better way to say that, more understanding and more industry industry standard around us. And so I I can Im I would imagine, Chris, that we would we would see a significant savings. Only in that the process is we can we can define that process better when we're scoping with our consultant team. And the consultant team knows what our activities would be. Which process would you prefer? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that loaded gun is not going to be pointed at my head. <laughs> no, that's um, your job, Scott. So <laughs> right now, in, so staff is prepared to move on. I didn't say you got to vote. I just said which <laughs> would you prefer. I do that with staff, staff recommends either. <laughs> I asked that yesterday, and he gave me the same answer. Okay. I'm not. Ta I'm not going there. So. This is a big decision. Mm -hmm. I recognize that. Staff mm -hmm. is prepared to do either, and we can do either effectively. One gives mm -hmm. us more industry standard around us, around the board and around the district. The other is truly experimental, and it talks about uh, uh, trying to develop this idea, this concept of, of a community group that is, is leading the decision process and is 
educated as we move into the process, which interestingly enough, Director Peters is in Chapter 2 of the M50, mm -hmm. where they're talking about you can either engage the public on the front end, and yes, it takes a lot longer and it costs a lot more money, or you can engage them in the end and it's shorter and it, and it can be painful. Or right. you can do or some combination of that's, And I think that's where the M50 can, can yeah. help us, right. to say, we recognize the two bookends in this process, let's strike for uh, a middle ground mm -hmm. following the middle way, or seeking the middle path. Um, and I think, to your point, uh, Director Beerwagon, it, it will uh, it will be cheaper, right? We're, we're, we would be shortening, I imagine, uh, the timelines that we would be operating on. So it, it boils down to how cutting edge and how, uh, how uh, experimental we want to be, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Mm, I don't know about cutting edge, because okay, right? I think they both take, they both take, uh, I think the experimental part, um, Rem, is about the community engagement piece. All the rest of it is the same. Is and that correct? So the, there's the technical a, so stuff. Technical technically, stuff yes. Is the, the same. The, yeah. But it's how we drive that group. Uh, the pathways, the pathways concept, allows the community to select multiple pathways to present to the board, multiple solutions, multiple strategies, uh, to get us out of the problem statement. The M50 process is a standard facilitation process. We'll be driving. That, that group will be driving towards a final recommendation to the board and a plan. Yeah. I don't think they have to be at the exclusion of each other. I think we can right. have public meetings to solicit input on what strategies. Say, these are the strategies we came up. Do you have any others? Do you think there's better ones? Mm -hmm. We could I, have a public meeting that does that. I don't absolutely. think, I don't think yeah. they're, at, they're mm -hmm. at odds that they can't both They're credit. just different in the end, in the end product. Mm -hmm. The end product, a presentation to the board is a single item or is many items for the board to decide on. But why would it have to be limited to one item? Why couldn't there be? Well, it doesn't the have to be. The M50 process is a process, right. just like the CRG process. It just has, uh, it has an understanding around it. But if we gave More direction to whatever consultant was doing it for mm -hmm. us, we could say, we don't want just one mm -hmm. pathway to use that sure. language. We want, you know, we want to see a menu of possibilities. Okay. Right? Sure. Okay. The menu has, has dollar signs attached to it. Understood. Okay. And, and if right. the pathway is a strategy, let's call it a strategy. <laughs> well, I, I honestly don't think that one strategy um, does it. This, right. is, this has got to be a multiple, mm -hmm. multiple strategy uh, solution. Um, I mean, just look, looking looking at it in in broad terms. I mean, there's demand side solutions and supply side solutions. Um, I don't think we can. I don't think we can achieve our objective, uh, which simply stated is replacing lost snowpack. I mean, that's the underlying that's the underlying situation. I don't think we get there with either a full supply side or a full demand side solution. And so, you know, whatever. So it will be a menu. Mm -hmm. it, it will be, it will be a menu for sure. Uh, and we need the process to define that menu. And you need, you you have to have the technical work uh, in the process to define the value of each proposed uh, pathway in terms of real water produced. And I've said that before, uh, but in the end, that becomes the issue um, because you know if we have lost 100,000 acre feet of snowpack. Uh, which in round numbers is fairly close, I think. Would you agree with that, Rem? Yeah. Right. Um, then whatever that smorgasbord of solutions that we come up with has to sum total to 100,000 or we are in serious trouble. I think that's, that's the bottom line. So um, I'll just say I, I don't have a preconceived notion on, on which we Go. I um, very much want to hear um, board member input on this, um, and my only concern is that we get to the same point either way, and in a at a reasonable cost and at a, in a reasonable amount of time, mm -hmm. without shortchanging the public input. Um, and I know that we're going to be criticized for whatever we do. Um, for um, 
you know, basically steamrolling the public. Oh well. Well, I don't know that we. I don't know that shortening the process is steamrolling the public. I would. It will be. It will be perceived that way. It could be used that way, or it could not be, depending on on how much inclusion there is, right? And I think. I, I agree. Yeah, and I think if I. You know, this board wants to include the public and wants to include the community and wants to include stakeholders to the maximum extent possible. Would that be correct? I and and I, I would agree with that. Okay. Uh, I have no 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 problems with that. Um, so thank you, Michael. Thank you, Golden Road. Thank you, The Source. I hobbled all the way over here. Thanks to my daughter, Angie, for dragging me out from Marin County. And I think it's important, injury and all, I wasn't taken out by Monsanto. This was another type of injury. Um, it's important that I show up because I resonate with just about what you all are saying. I resonate with that, and that's why I'm here to kind of bring this all together. And what I've learned after doing over 45 talks since that book came out a year ago was that it's not how many of us show shows up it's who shows up and don't underestimate the value of what one two or three committed people can do especially when you activate the mama bear it's, it's my secret weapon. Um, usually the goal of my medical practice is to piss off as many women as I possibly can and um, the effects are phenomenal so there is so many, I came to talk about something today, but hearing everyone speak, I thought I would try to maybe tie it all in. Um, what I'm hearing uh, people speak about, glyphosate in your ditches, I didn't know that was an issue. The copper issue, health-wise very significant. Glyphosate, Roundup, GMOs, glyphosate, Roundup, a big issue. And certainly what you just heard about 5G, I've been alarmed my, myself about 5G. There are tremendous parallels between what happened with GMOs and 5G, especially in terms of industry uh, lies, just outright collusion, lies, and orchestrated attempts by, not attempts, successful maneuvers by industry, how to bamboozle us. It's just quite incredible. So I thought I would talk about children. I've been a pediatrician for almost four decades, and I'll try so I can just touch upon the different points that you all heard today regarding our kids' health, because our children are not faring that well. I'll throw out a few st st statistics because I'm an MD. I love stats, and people seem to believe me more when I talk about statistics, especially you science folks out there who don't want to hear me talk about uh, homeopathy, for example, one of my other passions. Um, so I won't talk about homeopathy. I'll talk about stats. So we now have an issue where one out of two kids has a chronic disease, so that you know. So when you go into a classroom now, half the kids are going to need IEPs and have, you have special ed. And um, I can tell you, most of my own, uh, most of my friends have kids who have issues, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not um, without an environmental link. Let's be clear. Two, right, 51% of American children now has a chronic disease. And for those of you who don't know, what a chronic disease means is a disorder that's been around for more than three months and is not curable, but curable by allopathic or Western medicine. For, for those of us who are integrative practitioners, my colleague and friend Dr. Liu is here, we do have other ways to heal chronic diseases, but I'll, I'm just going to stick to what's reported in what we call Western uh, medicine or allopathic medicine. And those diseases span the spectrum. It's across all boards of health issues from obesity, one out of three kids, asthma, one out of six, to one, out, one out of every eight, autistic spectrum disorder, one out of 34 boys, one out of 58 kids, which has gone up since I even wrote the book that came out a year ago, neurocognitive disorders, sleep, out, sleep issues, two out of three kids can't sleep, they have dysomnias under the age of 10, and those are my favorite disorders because people are very motivated to make changes when their kids don't sleep. I just pray everyone's kids can't sleep. Having a kid up all night, oh, you'll change something. So these are the kind of things we're seeing, and I 
don't want to leave that mental health issue because in Western medicine, we cut off the head from the rest of the body as if that's a separate disorder. Mental health issues like depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorders, et cetera, are also sky high. About half of teens report those health issues, 46%. So you see, I think, did I lay the case that we have an issue among our children? And this is not just our children, it's our dogs. One out of 1.6 dogs will now develop cancer. The most common cancer is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My own last dog died of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the reason why you and I know why that is, because that is the leading tumor associated with Roundup, and Mr. Dwayne Johnson, our hero, unfortunately, has a form of non, a very aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and since Mr. Johnson's case came up, there's been about 9,000 lawsuits filed against Monsanto, now Bayer. So this is changing. So anyway, I can go on and on, but I, I don't want to talk so much about, you know, I, you, I, I think you all get the picture that our kids uh, have some issues, right? Our dogs, the wildlife, the bees, it's, we're in the web. I don't need to preach that to this crowd. I think we all get it here. So we got a health issue. So how did I get into this? I got into this as an unwilling activist. I am not an activist by nature. I'm just a feisty New Yorker. I'm just a sassy pediatrician. But I was roped in by one of my moms, a parent from my old practice. And these gals in a kitchen in Marin County were stopping the spray against the light brown apple moth that was going to take place along the entire coast of Northern California around 2006. And one county got sprayed, Monterey. And these gals stopped the spray. And I say these gals, and it wasn't me. I just kind of sat around and drank organic coffee. They were amazing cooks. I ate really well. And so, but during that time, they said they stopped the spray, and I just kind of went along for the ride. And they said, Michelle, what do you think about GMOs? And I didn't really have a thought about GMOs. I'm embarrassed to think about that now. GMOs have been around since 1996. I didn't know a damn thing about them. And I said, I'm not thinking much. And one of the moms, Lisa, pointed me to Jeffrey Smith's book. And I read Seeds of Deception. And that's what opened my eyes into the journey of relating to this plethora of chronic disease in our children and understanding the link between chronic disease in kids and the effects of GMOs and their associated pesticides, which are glyphosate-based herbicides. You don't eat a GMO alone without its associated herbicide and effect on our kids' health. So I want to go into a little bit about what these things do and the effect on our health and why that, how that ties into this water issue, because I really want to keep it germane to what, Michael, what the topic of this show is, is the contamination of the water and what's happening here, not just here. And oh my gosh, so many counties now in California. So. Glyphosate, which is this ubiquitous, very simple glycine-containing molecule, when you look at the chemical structure, it's like you've got to be kidding. This little thing does all this damage? Yes, indeed. It's very physiologic-looking. It contains glycine and phosphonylmethylglycine. I know more about this molecule than I know about like things that I really should be studying, but I know a lot about glyphosate. And what this, this an incredible molecule does is, well, number one, it's an antibiotic. And Monsanto Bayer um, patented as an antibiotic in 2010 as an antiprotozoal uh, uh, patent. And when I read the patent, because I have a tight sphincter, and I went back and looked at that patent, I said, what the hell does this stuff do? What it does is not only kill off protozoa, but Monsanto touted it as an antibiotic against strep, staph, every pathogen, even malaria. Every pathogen you can probably possibly think of was, um, was going to be uh, helped by glyphosate as an antibiotic. So you would think, based on that, that we would have studied the effect of glyphosate on the human microbiome. That is the collection of organisms that make up your gut. Your gut is made up of bacteria, viruses, and yeast, and they work in a community called the micro biome, the, the, the mycobiome, and the virome. And it's a very complex interaction because, in fact, we are mostly microbial in origin. Anywhere from 1 to 1 to 10 to 1. It just depends on the individual. You want a big, robust community of microbes in your gut because they are the basis for your health. Do not underestimate the value of microbiome. Love your gut bacteria. So this glyphosate no studies, no human studies in the effect of microbiome, but one may be coming out. 
our friend here in the audience may know a little bit about that, but that may, that literature is going to be emerging very shortly. It's being studied and it's going to be published pretty soon. So, and it, the, the, the results are showing that yes, indeed, glyphosate affects the human bi microbiome um, and Roundup is, makes it even worse. Understand that glyphosate, glyphosate is bad, Roundup is worse. So we all, we all clear on that. No, good question. I didn't even plant you in the audience. So glyphosate and, uh, no, they're not the same. So round, glyphosate is the main ingredient in um, uh, over 700 formulations, Roundup being the most popular. What every company does, whether it's Bear Monsanto, Syngenta, Dow, they and add inerts. Now don't notice I put those little, my little fingers waving in the air. Those inert are not so inert. For example, in Roundup has something called POEA, and what that is is a surfactant, and surfactants break down fat. And where you have fat is in your nerve cells, for example, in cell membranes, your mitochondria and the cells. So what those surfactants do is break down the cell membra membrane so the glyphosate can enter the cell and make it yet more toxic. So Roundup has been shown to be way more toxic than glyphosate alone. Most of that work came out of France by Dr. Gilles Eric Serralini, and boy, he was raked over the coals, but emerged triumphant. He's one of the biggest proponents that Roundup is way more toxic than glyphosate. But be clear, glyphosate in itself is not benign. So number one, it's an antibiotic. Number two, it's a metal chelator. That means, chelation means it binds minerals like copper, zinc, magnesium, chromium, and all those cobalt, all those essential minerals that you have in your body. And the way that this was discovered is when glyphosate was first brought into the market in the 70s, it was invented in 1950, by the way, by a Japanese researcher, it's been around forever, is that they use it as a metal cleaner. The, the staff for company used it as a metal cleaner. And they saw the weeds were dying around where they were cleaning these heavy metals. So they realized that not only is this a heavy metal cleaner, but it's an herbicide. And that's how they started. So it binds. We don't have any human studies on how it binds in humans. We have in cows. We have no human studies of the effect of GMOs and pesticides in humans. We have two studies on BT toxin in humans, two. And BT is a form of genetic, mo mod genetic modification using um, uh, bacteria. And so that's what we're eating, just aside. So it's a metal chelator. What am I seeing clinically in kids? Is this relevant? Well, it's relevant to your copper issue. I hear folks out here talking about copper. Yes, it is relevant. So when I see children, they're mineral deficient. They look clinically mineral deficient. They have these little white lines on their nails, these little horizontal lines. They have ridging on the sides of their tongues. They have coarse, dry hair. Clinically, you can look at kids and see that they're sick. You don't have to even have a laboratory. It's called physical exam. Oh, wow, that's crazy. You actually examine a child, and you see that they don't look well. So what we do is when you check them and you do some lab work because men want to see data, so I show the dads the numbers, the numbers are low. These kids, you cannot operate your brain without magnesium and zinc. And kids are low. When you restore their nutrients, they get better. Amazing. Clinical, clinical medicine. It's amazing. That's using minerals. Okay? Our children are deficient. The dogs are deficient. The soil is deficient. We're all related. So this is the other thing that's going on. Copper, just so you know, because I hear so much talk about copper, I, I didn't plan to come talk about heavy metals and talk, because we do need some copper to run our bodies. But copper is in a very nice relationship with zinc. So when you have too much copper, it drives down your zinc. And you need zinc to run about 250 reactions in your brain. And so if you have a kid who's zinc deficient, you better look for mental health issues. So when you have kids who can't focus, who have depression, who have anxiety, why don't you check their mineral levels? And we've known this for over a hundred years. It's called orthomolecular medicine. Dr. Abraham Hoffer in the 30s, 1930s, study this. And it's a big field of medicine that most pharmaceutical-based medicine will not want you to know because minerals are not patented. They're cheap to treat. One bottle of minerals will cost you about eight bucks, last you about two months, right? You know, we, I won't go down that road. You don't want to take me down that road. No, this is not conspiracy theory. This is just reality. Is there a way people can get their minerals tested? Ooh, indeed they can. I think after I speak, I'm going to let Dr. Lou talk about it. Go, she is a freaking master with the oligo scan. Oh, my gosh. She did mine. Mm, not pretty. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lou. 
it's, I'm a work in progress. I'm always working on my own health. But yes, we work on this together. A couple more things that glyphosate will do, and then I'll move on. It blocks one of the key detoxification pathways in your body called the cytochrome P450 system. So we can't detox. Our kids are toxic. They can't detox. They already have diminished detoxification. And GMOs also reduce their ability to detox by reducing something called glutathione, the master antioxidant in their bodies. Separate research, separate stuff. I don't want to go into the GMO pathway. I want to stick to glyphosate and Roundup because I think that's really relevant right now to your show, what you folks are doing and what we really need to focus on. You heard about the carcinogenic issue. It was labeled by the World Health Organization as a class 2A carcinogen. It would have, which means probable, it would have been an absolute carcinogen except they didn't study it in humans, just uh, animals uh, and rats. And that's why it's a 2A and not a class 1 carcinogen. If they had done the human studies, they would have shown that it was also a carcinogen in humans as well. I just wrote a paper, the effect of pesticides on the microbiome and the link to childhood leukemia. It's going to be out on uh, my website, www.gmoscience.org, and you're not going to find this anywhere else. We referenced over 25 articles in that. We publish twice a month, my little brilliant group and, and myself. Um, bringing out the best uh, literature on pesticides, GMOs, and the effect on health. And we are totally um, <clears throat> underfunded uh, volunteers. We're a lot like your group, Michael. We don't get a lot of money, and we're on a shoestring budget, but we have some of the best people in this field working on this topic. You're not going to find the effects of GMOs and pesticides on health just about anywhere. And this is a travesty. Um, other things that glyphosate does, as if that's not enough, and this is based on the work of Dr. Samsel and Dr. Seneff, and they've taken some heat too, is that, that glycine, which is um, one of the major components of collagen, which makes up your musculoskeletal system, swaps out with the, gly with the glyphosate. So you may be having a substitution of glycine in your collagen with glyphosate. And the reason why that's a problem is it can cause musculoskeletal issues. And when you examine children today, they're doughy. If you felt a kid recently, go feel a kid. Um, and they are absolutely doughy. Their musculoskeletal system feels, doesn't feel robust. Um, and so this is uh, something I've wondered about. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Where's the data? I'm just going a lot on anecdote, and I'm honest about that. I say when I know something, I say when there's science to back it up, and I say when this is just clinical and an anecdotal. But after doing this now for 12 years, I've been on this road, I have over 5,000 anecdotes. How many anecdotes do you actually want? 20,000, 50,000 anecdotes. I have a lot of anecdotes. So I see something once, I see it twice, I see it three times, and I know I'm onto something. And this is called clinical acumen. It's called clinical experience. So that's what the problem with the glyphosate is. And you heard a little bit about copper um, and the zinc balance that I'm concerned about in your environment. And the last thing I want to touch off is regulators only measure high doses of glyphosate. And we now know that dose does not make the poison that you have an inverse curve at the bottom of very low levels of glyphosate. Actually, the best study I saw was on Roundup. So you, it kind of goes like this. There's a curve, right? X, Y. My daughter would be so proud. My, I remember those linear graphs. But look, going right up, more glyphosate, more toxicity. Let's, let's use Roundup, more toxicity. But oh, at the very bottom, there's an inverse U where there's toxicity at very low doses. And those are doses where parts per billion, where your endocrine system work. And Michael Antonio and his group out of King's College in London showed that two parts per billion of Roundup, that is way lower than anything we're eating, caused, not correlated, caused something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in adults, in our rats. Now, we happen to have an epidemic now of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in adults. One out of four people, according to the American Liver Association, has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They're blaming it on the fructose because we're all eating this high fructose corn syrup. But is it the fructose or what the fructose comes from? It comes from corn. Corn is genetically modified and it is sprayed. You do not eat corn that's not organic 
that's not been genetically modified. About 96% of, of corn now that's not organic in the U.S. is genetically modified. So if it's not organic, it's genetically modified. So this liver issue is silent. And it goes on to develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which then goes on to cirrhosis. Kids have it too, especially obese children, and they already have the NASH, the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is the more, more advanced form. It was out of an Italian study. We get a lot of our information out of Europe because Americans are not allowed to uh, research a lot of these issues here because science and universities are owned by big agribusiness. You were talking about Bill Gates before, they own Cornell. Now they're getting into Harvard. Purdue owned, Davis owned. These are owned. They cannot produce research that doesn't align itself with the big agribusiness that's funding them. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. So their research gets shut down. Scientists have been we are silenced. If you want to watch a good video, we produce the video about this on our website. Feel free to take it and use it. And it links our, what we find to tobacco industry. Now, I could probably go on for about three hours, but I'll just zip it up here and allow for questions. Great. And so we can sort of wrap this up because, you know, I get wound up. I get very excited. I'm very passionate about this topic. So let's take some questions. Yes. What you're saying is fascinating, and I'd like to know more details about your video and how I could actually maybe get involved in the fight with the right groups, possibly. Woohoo! Do you have yeah, a. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I'd like to know your website and all that. Absolutely. We'd love to give it out. Good, good, good. Yeah. Right. So. Um, before I leave. Well, before we leave, we'll get you that information. Maybe Michael can put it on this, the source. Yeah, I I thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And if you go to our website, www.gmoscience.org, we have a section called Videos, and we produce this video, and it's a great video. It's a great teaching tool. And um, I'll give you that information again, yeah. and you can get it from the source and off our website. So one of the things that really impressed me when I was at the state capitol meeting is with all of you, you actually showed a chart with uh, Bayer, Monsanto, AstraZeneca, and how this closed loop of economic benefit is really self-explanatory. Could you just talk about that mm -hmm. for a minute, uh, where it goes to the livestock and the agriculture and people and yes. the pharmaceutical companies? Well, and I have to give credit where credit's due. That beautiful chart was from my dear friend Howard Vlieger, student of the soil, who's a farmer, an organic farmer for decades, who's been on this battle even, you know, um, before most of us even knew what glyphosate was. And so th the way that Howard does it, and he does this brilliantly, and he walks the walk. Mr. Vlieger walks the war walk. And what he shows is basically from the beginning of the curve, starting with you know um, our food source all the way around that companies like AstraZeneca are making money at both ends. The AstraZeneca produces pesticides they also produce the drug for breast cancer right yep. so and basically so what Howard does and he shows you and and if anybody wants that slide you reach out to me and I will get you that slide from Howard he would he will comply and we can put it on your website Oh, oh, go, oh my God, technology, praise Jesus, hallelujah, I love it. Um, I'm also, uh, I am a Luddite, but I've learned to embrace technology, and, um, like my 5G colleague there, whose name I can't remember, um, thank you. Uh, so, and that's basically what it's showing, this web of how it's all bought in um, from uh, the beginning to the end, and it's a web, and, and all these links to the web of how this is uh, produced. And the big agribusiness are making money at both ends. So, and you know, when we're sick, they make money to keep us sick. Yeah. It's a kind of a dystopian kind of thought. And as a pediatrician, I don't like to think that way. We're supposed to be like the happy doctors, right? But this is how we need to think. Any other questions that I can answer for you? Can I have questions for Brian? Yes, please, please. So my name is Joni Blackster, and full disclosure, I'm the national sales manager for a company called Just Thrive. And the study that Michelle was referring to earlier is a study conducted by the research microbiologist behind Just Thrive. His name is Kieran Krishnan. 
and what uh, it's not, what we now have is technology that reproduces in what is called a gut model study, it reproduces the conditions in a human microbiome. Because when you're testing substances like glyphosate and Roundup, you obviously it's not moral and ethical to test it on real people. So they have took three gut model studies, they calibrated them to represent the gut microbiome of a three-year-old, and I asked the microbiologist why, and he said because the conditions are actually very different in a young child's microbiome than an adult. And uh, one of those gut models was the control. The second, number two, they dumped glyphosate, just straight glyphosate into it and measured the effect on the gut microbiome. In the third, they added Roundup, measured the effect on the bacteria population in the gut microbiome. Then what they did was they added the uh, proprietary formula of licensed strains, spore bacteria. These are a new concept to us, the spore bacteria to each one of the uh, gut models and measured the effect. We already know from a human clinical trial that these particular strains uh, created a 42% reduction in the toxins that are produced by pathogens in the gut, and that happened at only one cap a day in 30 days with no changes in diet or lifestyle. So we are expecting uh, to definitely see uh, some significant results from the study. If people are interested in learning more about it, uh, because it's not, uh, it's still in process for being peer-reviewed, analyzed, uh, and it will eventually be published. Um, once that happens, those results will be listed on the Just Thrive website, which is thriveprobiotic.com. If people have any other questions about that, uh, I am going to be in a lot of interaction with the microbiologist in the next couple of months, and I'm going to be completely picking his brain about it. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, call me or email me. My phone number is uh, area code 831-246-0162. And my uh, address, email address, is Joni, J-O-A-N-I-E, Blackster, B-L-A-X-T-E-R, dot rep at gmail. So uh, this is probably the most exciting thing that I have ever been able to be personally involved with, so I'm happy to talk about it with anyone. And Michelle is, in a few days, I believe, in less than a week, going to be in a conversation, a phone conversation with the microbiologist about the results we have so far. Thank you. Thank you. So I think um, I'll wrap up with a couple things that you can do on a positive note because, Michael, I really like what you're saying here is Dr. Doom and Gloom, no thanks. Let's be part of the solution because, you know, this stuff can be pretty depressing. So one, I mean, eat organic. I think everybody gets that. Um, two, you need to uh, give your um, gut a plentiful of bacteria, um, certainly either in the form of probiotics, sporebiotics, fermented food, and or all of that. Fermented food does work, um, and um, even I, I'm no Martha Stewart, even I had my hand at fermenting, and I actually did okay. Um, so yes, ferment, ferment, ferment. Um, that's what I tell people to do. I do people tell people get a water filter, and I do tell people to take the shoes off at the door, even though my house, I can't get people to do it except me, and then I walk barefoot on all their crap. But um, the reason why that's so important is because the most toxic thing in your house is your house dust. That's right. Um, the s biggest source is pollution and house dust. And house dust has been shown to have high levels of tons of toxins and toxicants. And so by just by taking your shoes off, you reduce the toxic load for yourself, children, and your pets. And having had three dogs now with cancer, I'm very sensitive to this issue, but this is indeed true. So those are kind of simple things that you can do at home. I used to tell people, put your money where your mouth is and just shop organic, that was enough, but that is not enough anymore. And so we all have to be part of the regenerative movement, and I think we all have to take a stand and do something, no matter what it is. Thank you. You guys pissed off a little bit? No. <laughs> Are you inspired a lot? There's hope. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carmen, 
And I just wanted to remind people that um, four out of the Monsanto eight that were arrested on October 15th at uh, Monsanto Woodland for protesting. <laughs> Our arraignment is coming up on the 22nd of this month. So uh, please give us all the support that you can. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we have one last speaker. I know we've gone a few minutes longer. Um, we are going to have some food after this. That's a time where we generally like to break bread and actually kind of let the rubber hit the road, per se. I know some people had to leave, so it's a little frustrating uh, for me sometimes to have so many amazing people here and trying to connect the dots. But one of the reasons that we spent hundreds of hours uh, with the programming to develop the technology and the network, everything you hear all the keynote speakers are all platinumized and they all have access and hopefully we're asking them even if it's just once a week post your events post this information let's create an alternative media source and information source outside of the corporate media who has uh, their own agendas so <laughs> Uh, George Olive, uh, Nevada City. Um, my, my comments have gotten shorter and shorter as more and more people have talked. This is a great meeting. It's wonderful to uh, hear what the directors think about uh, a current issue. Uh, you know, uh, there are a number of groups working in parallel with the NID directors uh, uh, focused on the raw, raw water master plan and associated issues. And, and um, I think this meeting is beginning to bring th those groups together with, uh, with the directors to co-consider what should happen with the raw water master plan process. Um, I would like to, to second, and I think there's going to be some thirds and fourths here, uh, uh, that the Foothill Water Network uh, letter of May 21st, 2018, um, should be center in in your in your deliberations right now. The points made in that letter. We send a lot of letters. Y y yeah. yeah. Th th so the key points uh, um, the key points th that I see in there. Um, yeah. Um, deal with the with the initial uh, process design, which is which we're talking about today. Um, uh, the proper makeup and role of the Tech Advisory Committee, collection of foundational hydrology, climate change, and raw water use data, which NID and HDR do not already have. This is data that has not been collected yet. Um, I, I had originally thought I was going to come up here and urge the directors to consider a third option, which was to back all the way up to step one and start over again. But but I think uh, the consideration, the deliberation you're going through now probably accomplishes that, and I appreciate your willingness to, um, to back up, as, as Dr. Miller has mentioned. Um, the reason I think reconsideration needs to be entertained um, is, as others have said and will say, um, that the initial steps taken in the process did not uh, consider involvement of the correct knowledgeable stakeholders. So n the correct set of people were not consulted in some manner to get the raw water master plan process going. The process as drafted also creates too much separation between the CRG and the, t and the TAC, as Mikos mentioned. Um, NID and HDR have too much control of the data. Current NID data, especially around population growth, um, in, in your service area, climate change and actual raw water need are incomplete. More data needs to be collected, which you, you guys uh, ha have already talked about. Um, there are applicable proven planning systems, such as the WEAP model, that could be brought to bear here, that could be helpful in your preparation to restart uh, and collect better data. And lastly, the Centennial Project, this was my original point, <laughs> the Centennial Project has prejudiced this process. Uh, pulling the data uh, compilation in a particular direction
to make the dam and a reservoir look like the best idea. So until the Centennial Dam is officially abandoned, the project is, is, is abandoned to the, to the legal extent possible, that, that prejudice is going to continue to be in the process. So I would urge the uh, directors to reconsider the plan for water and find ways to, to take advantage of the expertise and systems that are available in the community. Thank you. Chair Miller, board, good morning. Peter Van Zandt, uh, Nevada City, NID mm -hmm. customer, taxpayer. Um, I also, like George, is going to cut my comments short, but I'm going to go to the point. Uh, that letter that was sent by the network in May, I hope you will pay attention to it. Uh, it really crystallized some of the issues that have come up over the last several months with the CRG. Um, and it says to dial back the public process to the basics in the manual, remember this one? Yeah. Uh, that started this process. So the specific, one of the specific asks is that set up a stakeholder uh, group, of, I'll address that in a second also, um, that sits in on the design of the process that we're all going to follow. That has not been done. Uh, this, the CRG and plan for water came out of staff, I believe. Uh, and specifically, not mentioned in the CRG, but a little bit in the plan for water, is the technical, technical advisory committee. Um, it's in the HDR scope of work, and we know that the raw water master plan is a technical document. And so the technical group is extremely important and as it's constituted now, it doesn't have a public component. And that's been done before. Uh, that can be worked out when we get all together, but you know, open meetings, uh, exchanges, workshops with the technical folks, because when it's all said and done, that's going to be the end product, not a two-year com community project where we just keep re, uh, re, re shuffling the strategic plan stuff. So um, I'm trying to cut this out. Okay. Oh, and stakeholders. Uh, I think you know the network has been involved with a lot of watershed projects. Circle is a science-based organization. That's how they do their watershed work. Uh, certainly we would be stakeholders. Uh, certainly the ag community has got to be uh, at that first table. And probably the local water managers in town, Grass Valley, Nevada City, Lake Wildwood, I'm not sure. A lot of expertise there and a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in what NID does. So um, just summing up, the network, circle, supportive of this process. We want the raw water master plan to be done, done right. And that is the document going forward. Personally, I like the idea of taking out the strategic plan part from the technical part. It seems to make sense. So uh, however you do that, please do it right. Thank you. Good morning, board. Uh, I'm Alan Fowler of Big Oak Valley, District 5. Uh, my main thing here is just a little feedback on what I saw in the CRG that I attended. The group I was in, I was surprised, had over half were engineers. Uh, I'm a physicist. We had a lot of technical information. Uh, lots of good ideas ca uh, came out of my group. And uh, I looked at the summary, and the summary were just platitudes. We need, we need more water. We need sustainability. None of the hard ideas came through. So uh, I think the CRG needs to be reevaluated and try and look for people with hard ideas. There are a lot of people here that have really good ideas. Um, I buy 41 inches of water a year. Uh, I don't want to see it go away. Thanks.
Uh, Otis Wallen from Colfax. Uh, just to, to remind that, that for over 30 years of my life, I was a facilitator, did strategic planning processes, multi-stakeholder stuff, including a half a million dollar eight-year process with Santa Clara Valley Water District on, on their major uh, strategic effort. So um, these comments come from that perspective. Uh, you know, I think the, the board would be well served to get more information so you can compare apples and oranges. The AWW plan is a good framework for planning. It's excellent. It's weak in the specifics of public outreach and other elements. And I would urge you to be discerning on a couple of different pieces. There's public outreach, there's stakeholder outreach, there's the technical advisory team and that outreach. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about the public outreach a little bit later. With regard to TAC, you have one TAC planned in the CRG. Uh, it strikes me that if you need technical information, the different kinds of information are ex just wildly varied. And you're not going to get good information unless you have climate change experts telling you about climate change. Demand reduction experts in the urban talking about that. Demand reductions on the rural side talking about that. Groundwater storage uh, uh, attack talking about that. Surface storage talking about that. Those are, you can't get the same technical person because they're so highly focused to talk about all of those things. You need the stuff on all of those different directions. With regard to stakeholders, the groundwater recharge stakeholders from Sacramento County and Western Placer are going to be very different than the surface water stakeholders. Uh, and the, the effects of that and, and all of those things. Demand side stakeholders, your customers and, and, and uh, us, that's going to be a different stakeholder group. So you have different tax, you have different stakeholder input teams, um, and you may want a process team, um, uh, you know, people who are informed about what does good facilitation look like to help you. Um, just, just looking a little bit about what you have so far. I attended the second meeting. Um, you know, I would say, the, as I looked at the participants, I recognized a great many of them. And the participants were preloaded for and again Centennial Dam. You had a very highly controversial thing out there. And so when you called for, for public input, it was the already polarized public that responded. So I'm not sure you got a really good balanced cross-section of public in your first two public meetings. The second piece, I was really not impressed by the facilitation at all. <coughs> My facilitator was extremely novice and clumsy. I heard that comment from a number of others. I was not impressed by the uh, process that they used. Wildly gathering all ideas and then trying to narrow it down and then focus it into these areas, as Mr. Fowler pointed out. If you try to do that with a random bunch of cross-section of, of public in 45 minutes, you are going to fail. And I think the product failed. Actually, I think if I took the uh, AWWA table of contents, sprayed the back with 3M adhesive, cut it into small phrases, scatter fluid against the wall, and then ask 12 random people from the public to come in and put it in categories, you would get something that was quite similar to what you got from two very expensive processes. So I'm not impressed with the product. Um, there's uh, there's uh, uh, other pieces. You've got some limitations in there. Uh, you only you only are calling for people to participate if they're within your jurisdiction. Um, Lordy, I feel like I'm a stakeholder. I'm out of your jurisdiction. My land is in your your uh, your red zone. Uh, you know, I've been part of a water agency in the past that I can easily say is a major stakeholder, part of Placer County and the groundwater plant that's out of your district, but major stakeholder. So the plan is flawed um, in a number of ways. Um, with regard to public outreach, uh, I think if you had strategic public outreach at strategic points along the AWWA framework, you would get much more valuable public input than you would having the group that's kind of already formed meeting on a monthly basis with a great deal of demand of their time. Um, 
I, I would urge you to, well, um, you know, the Cal State Center for Collaborative Policy is, is a much used facilitation and strategic planning group in our region, well versed in all kinds of water facilitation and strategic planning. Susan Sherry is the, is the point person that I know. She retired a few years ago. She may be available in her retirement as a consultant to actually say, what would the AWW plan look like if you actually did an elegant process of public participation at the strategic moment, maybe four meetings over 16 months? The stakeholder groups, even more critical early on, that stakeholder input, and the multiple tasks to develop the, the, the level of gr the fine grained information you need to make a good decision. And I think until you have those pieces put together, you're not going to be able to select AWWA over CRG with any level of useful information and balance in making a decision. So I would just uh, urge you to do that, and, and there are lots of people in the community with lots of experience in lots of different fields who are here to help you. So thanks very much for your time. I appreciate this discussion this morning. Good morning, board, staff, public. My name is Ashley Overhouse. I'm the policy manager at the South Yuba River Citizens League, also affectionately known as CIRCLE. We're a member organization of the Foothills Water Network and respectfully resubmitted the May 2018 letter to you with a cover sheet yesterday morning. I'm going to read the cover sheet for the privilege of those that do not have a copy in front of them. The Foothills Water Network is a coalition of non-governmental organizations concerned with watershed management issues in the American, Bear, and Yuba River watersheds. Given the network's experience and observations of early efforts by the Nevada Irrigation District's implementation to update a raw water master plan update process, the network respectfully resubmits the attached letter for consideration by the recently seated board directors, relevant staff, contractors, and the public. NID's raw water master plan update process is a challenging undertaking and deserves a robust and open process to assure a credible outcome. While many individuals and interested organizations are considering engagement with NID's process, significant disappointment has been registered about its implementation. The network believes the recommendations in the May 2018 letter should be incorporated. Most important among them is the need to establish a fully representative stakeholder group at the beginning that helps guide the formation of the process itself. Stakeholders must trust the process in which they engage. Stakeholder trust is established by early involvement in developing the process, its goals, objectives, parameters, and work products. As far as the network understands, CRG has not been defined as far as its actual work product, and the public involved in forming the process did not happen. Please consider that the signers of the letter are well informed about Yuba Bear watershed issues and represent decades of collective experience in multiple stakeholder natural resource management processes. The network intends that reconsideration of the May letter by NID board, staff and others will help assess and correct what appears to be a prescriptive process that does not evaluate community input or incorporate the best possible data. I also have some questions, if possible, that could be answered now in public comment or maybe later in the general manager's report. We're not in public comment, we're on an agenda item. Great, thank you, Director Miller. The first question is, where else in California has the AWWA M50 process been used outside of ND, um, NID? They mentioned that it's been used throughout the state in the presentation. We would love to know examples of other water districts in California that have used that process. Question number two, slide number three in the presentation, bullet number three. What were those facilitated exercises that helped form that process? Were they public? The network was not aware of those facilitated exercises that helped form this process. Question number three, depending on how the board votes or its decision today, what are NID's next steps with the technical components of the raw water master plan? 
We are especially concerned about the original scope of work for HBR and the formation of the Technical Advisory Committee that was included in that original scope of work last year. Question number four, have you consulted state and federal agencies about this process, invited them to this meeting so they could hear about this plan for water update and your consideration about different processes when you are considering public involvement going forward? Thank you so much for your time. So, uh, Lisa, this isn't public comment, this is an agenda item. Great. So, who might address some of those answers? Item number three sounds like a vendor. The first one sounded like the general manager. So, I don't know exactly how to I don't know what other jurisdictions have used M50 that were where we prepared ourselves. Uh, the facilitated work was internal to staff as we started to prepare the external stuff. Um, no other outside entities were invited to this meeting as this was a board decision. Bullet number three? There was facilitation with of staff. Oh, that, that is the Yes, staff, the staff came in. Number three was yeah. That was number four. four. Mm -hmm. uh, next step is the board will decide M50 is the OG. After that, staff will start working on the work product that previously got. So where'd the M50 come from then? It was not by me, it's by anybody else. It has, I don't know who it is. We just don't know who it is. <laughs> huh? Thank you, I appreciate those answers. Greta? So again, my name is Michael DiMartino from Nevada City. Uh, I am an investigative journalist. And again, as I spoke earlier, I did start my own a uh, regional show dedicated to the Sacramento River watershed to look at all of the issues that not just affect Nevada County, but affect all of the people who are also upstream and downstream because besides the county, we are also a interconnected bioregion and all of these issues deeply affect the region, not just here in Nevada County. Uh, once again, with a world of respect and appreciation for what NIV does, um, over the last couple years of interviewing over 300 in indi individuals and organizations, I've come to realize how disconnected our community really is and how many people are working in silos and can only understand and see what they see. So I want to commend uh, the speaker who be came before me. He said there are a lot of people in this community um, who have a lot of knowledge and effort to assist, I think, in the process. Um, I will say that... Uh, the CRG is an important component to this uh, new plan because pub public involvement is the basis of our democracy. And transparency in a day and age where we can see how many people have expressed discontent by the lack of public involvement is pretty prolific in any area you look, whether it's economics, environment, whatever it might be. So I, again, I commend you in having the vision to involve the community in these discussions. And again, transparency is key. Um, one of the things uh, I was a little bit horrified to find out, uh, even though I think it was an effort in the right direction, is the cost of the bureaucratic process of drawing together information in the CRG processes. I think as someone who has, for the last two years, hosted and paid out of pocket to host these public forums on a monthly level, focused on what's called community resilience, and resilience is now a new buzzword. Resilience is looking beyond sustainability. It's actually looking at regeneration using methods of um, thinking like permaculture. How can we restore our groundwater? Uh, how can we create our environment or co-create with nature to have a better system than the way that we've done things over the last 150 years, per se? So there's a lot of new science and technology and a lot of amazing hundreds of people, I believe, and know in this community that I've interviewed and identified that I think could be great resources that probably would be happy to donate some of their time and efforts without having to bring in external consulting firms. And I'm not trying to, you know, dog anyone in their efforts or whatever their business is and how they get their paycheck. But I think that this is a real issue that uh, a lot of people who have the background and just hearing with the representative from Circle, it's very obvious that a lot of people want to be involved in the process. So looking at that process, I don't think it's going to take two years. 
I think if there was a realistic public forum where uh, even a month from now, because I do forums every month, we could get really the, the educated stakeholders to the table to talk intelligently about the science and about the research and to offer some really practical ideas as opposed to the process, how it went. I did go to the second meeting in Auburn, and uh, although I thought it was a lovely idea to see, you know, hey, I'm Farmer Bill, and I want more water, that those kind of inputs, I think that that can be really time consuming and can cost a lot of money, as we've heard. So um, just to wrap up, I want to be where the rubber hits the road, okay? I have a lot of other things I could be doing today and making money, but I volunteered as a concerned citizen to be here and spend my afternoon uh, because holding these public forums every month, being a broadcaster at KVMR, being someone who has presented on both KAHI radio and KNCO, having relationships with KZFR radio, working with KUBU at Sacramento, and public access to several uh, counties, I am willing to step up, as I already am part of the public committee and the CRG group, to help be the tip of the spear to help organize these forums and make sure that the organizations and the educated stakeholders with the science and the uh, credentials behind them make it to that table and to help get people out of their silos so we can continue to move this agenda forward in an intelligent way. And I would say I would be willing to do that with no expense at all to NID because these are issues that have to be brought to light and addressed. And I do this every month at the Digital Media Center where we could actually be broadcasting it. Maybe some seniors can't come and they're at home, they could watch it on television. We could broadcast the KBMR Facebook page, which my last, last broadcast had about a thousand people participating. It takes more than sending out 60 emails and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on billboard. It takes getting in touch with the people who are the community leaders who can activate people and bring back the faith and trust to make some real positive change in our community. And by what I'm hearing today, I know all of you are committed to that. So thank you for your time, and um, congratulations to Laura Peters, who I had the honor to, to interview. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Do you know of anybody down at Lake Pines? Do you know anyone in the Lake of the Pines? Uh, yes, sir. Who um, might that be? Uh, well, I can't pull up the name right now, but just to answer that question. What's their field of expertise? Uh, uh, my microbiology, also water hydrology. Uh, the reason I've been working with this person is about the issue of a, a mass extermination of the, uh, the geese population in, rec in response to the E. coli uh, infection that's happened down there. It's the wrong approach to it. So if anybody wants to go online to the source directory dot org, I created a resource of a thousand individuals and organizations throughout the region who are actively involved and have been for decades around community building and are, are scientists and people that we could draw from as advisors. And I've done this all on my own coin, again, as a concerned citizen to try to bring these resources to light that we could use. I can happily go into that this afternoon and whatever protocol is appropriate, get back to the board with some of these resources and contacts um, to w however it can assist the process. Good morning, board. My name is Tracy Sheehan, Foothills Water Network. I have to say I'm very heartened and optimistic by the conversation and the discussion at the board level today about this issue, so thank you.